UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres enraged Israeli officials yesterday with an incredibly pro Hamas speech. As Israel's forces await the orders to go into Gaza, we're seeing an eradication of morality in the international sphere. I'm going to talk about this and a lot more coming up on In Focus. Tuesday, the UN Security Council uh, had a meeting about uh, Hamas's war against Israel and the larger jihad being directed by Iran through its tentacles in the region against the Jewish state. Um, and uh, in one of the most grotesque displays of the immorality that is the United Nations, Secretary General Antonio Guterres gave a speech where he essentially paid lip service to Hamas for about, I mean, to to, to Israel and, and condemned Hamas's massacre and slaughter of Jews in southern Israel on October 7th. I think he spent about 30 seconds on that. And then the remaining time of his six-minute speech, he, he devoted to condemning every aspect of Israel's operations to defeat Hamas and to defend itself against Hamas. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence. Their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. The relentless bombardment of Gaza by Israeli forces, the level of civilian casualties, and the wholesale destruction of neighborhoods continue to mount and are deeply alarming. I am deeply concerned about the clear violations of international humanitarian law that we are witnessing in Gaza. And Israeli officials were rightly enraged um, at all levels of government, UN Ambassador Gilad, Erdogan called for Guterres to resign. Foreign Minister Eli Cohen, who flew to New York for the for the uh, for the Security Council session, canceled his plans to meet with Guterres. And now the government is reconsidering uh, its decision to respond positively to requests by UN officials to receive visas to come to Israel, and uh, they're likely going to be denied. I I certainly hope they are, and so. Um, the question is, uh, you know, what's wrong with that, right? What is wrong with Guterres' speech and what do we really learn from it? Because his defenders say, look, you know, I mean, he also, he, he spent that whole 30 seconds saying that he condemned Hamas before he launched into his broadside against Israel and denied our right to self-defense, denied our right to really to survive because he called for Israel to stop every action that it's taken or is considering taken in order to defeat Hamas. And he also uh, said that Hamas is in the right. He put uh, Hamas's slaughter, torture, rape, abduction of thousands of Israelis, murder of 1,400 plus, abduction of 200 plus, torturing, uh, 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 raping, um, decapitation, dismemberment, disfigurement of of thousands of Israelis, all of these things uh, he put into a context, a context of Israel's crimes against the Palestinian people, all of which are imaginary. Um, and, and you know, to understand, again, what we're looking at here, why it is that he's so depraved, why it is that he is endorsing the slaughter of innocents by explaining it away, we have to talk for a few minutes today about what morality is. No, morality is a distinction between good and evil. I mean, at the most basic level, it's a distinction between good and evil and the ability to distinguish between the two of them. Uh, perhaps the easiest way to distinguish is really about how forces in this world relate to the concept of life. Forces of good throughout history, uh, 
whether they're few or many, view life as sacred. God created man in his image. After his likeness, the image of God, he created him male and female. And the idea is that we are all God's children. God created us. He sanctified our lives by creating us. And it doesn't matter where you fall on the issue of evolution. The basic concept of good is that human life is sacred. Okay? The basic concept of evil is that death is sacred and that life is worthless. Hamas and its allies in the global jihad sanctify death. Israel and the forces of good in the world sanctify life. And so at the most existential basic level, and, and they sanctify death as part of their dogma. They're proud of their sanctification of death, and they say that that sanctification places us above us, mere mortals who believe that life is sacred. So it's not that they hide their sanctification of death. They celebrate it. And they say that that's their path to world domination and to the genocide of Jews and the destruction of Western civilization, human freedom, etc., in the name of Islam. That's what they say. And we say, of course, the opposite. So it, it's amazing. It's, it's a sign of a continuous rejection or refusal to reckon with morality that has brought us to this low point where Guterres said, oh, 78 years since the UN Charter was founded, this is, or, or passed, ratified, this is, this is the 78th birthday of the UN, and we're celebrating it. He said this after he gave a benediction to evil, okay? And you ask yourself, how is it that all of these years later, after the establishment of the UN, after the Holocaust, we've gotten to this low point in our lives where a UN Secretary General could make the most depraved speech. I think, you know, most of us have ever heard from the mouths of a, of a UN official, and that's very difficult because UN officials have said horrific things uh, relating to Jews, particularly over the past uh, 50, 60, 70 years. So what is it? And I think that we have to start with uh, the Holocaust. It's not just because uh, the slaughter on October 7th that Hamas enacted upon the Jewish people was a Holocaust-level slaughter, although it was jihadist in character. Um, it's because for 78 years, the West, the peoples of the West, have evaded a moral reckoning with the Holocaust. And that's really what's coming up today. That's what's bubbling up, in fact, pouring forth from beneath the surface like terrorists from Hamas tunnels. It's this absence of moral reckoning with the Holocaust. Instead of reckoning, because the Holocaust too, like the forces of death versus the forces of life today, the Holocaust too was an easy division of humanity between those that supported the annihilation of the Jewish people and the enslavement of all humanity to this concept of racial superiority of the German Aryans over, uh, over lower races in the name of German imperialism. That was the aspiration of the German uh, nation under Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime. That's what they wanted. It was, a, it was an imperialist move that was founded on a theory of race that placed them at the top of the totem pole and placed the Jews at the bottom and 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 propelled them forward in their their aspiration to dominate the globe and to annihilate the Jews. And that was the Third Reich. That was what it was. And at the end of the war, the German people, through the denazification process, were supposed to have a moral reckoning with what they had done. They evaded that moral reckoning by embracing moral relativism and by rejecting the tools that they used in carrying out pure evil rather than the evil itself. So rather than say we eschew evil, we embrace good, Germany is going to be a force for good rather than evil, 
we're going to stand with the Jews, not only because they're the victim, but because they're a force for good in the world. No, they said, we reject militarism. We are pacifists. We don't want a military. Now it's true that it wasn't all bad because the Germans really couldn't be trusted with an army after World War II. That's true. So it's good for them to be pacifists because who wants them to have another Luftwaffe? Certainly not in 1945, but pacifism is not the same as good. It's a tool, just like terrorism is a tool. It is the doctrine behind the militarism that determines whether a military is a force for life or a force for death. And if you're not willing to look at the doctrine, if you're not willing to look at the values, at the beliefs of the body that is wielding the sword, then you're not going to be able to understand the conflict. You're not going to be able to know whose side you're on. What Antonio Guterres did was he talked about the swords. He talked about the means of war, a siege, a uh, uh, um, aerial bombing, etc., that Israel is carrying out in order to attribute evil designs to Israel because he didn't want to deal with the basic fact that Hamas is evil and Israel is good, that Hamas sanctifies death and Israel sanctifies life, and that we use our military, our bombs, our munitions, our siege in order to protect life, innocent life, first and foremost, the lives of our people who are good people. He didn't want to see the distinction between evil and good because he sides with evil. And he made that very clear in the speech, which is why it was so appalling, right? Because if you don't want to see the distinction, if you want to just look at the tools, it's the means to promote good or to promote evil and not look at what they are at their base, then you're promoting evil. In his case, he did it outright because he spent a good, you know, a whole 30 seconds saying that what Hamas did was bad and then another five and a half minutes attacking Israel. But it's all part of the same moral relativism that only advances the cause of evil because it refuses to see a distinction between good and evil. So if you're against guns, are you against murderers? You're against guns. Now, who wields the gun is the real question. I've, you know, we've been carrying guns everywhere, sleeping with them by our, our bedside since October 7th. Does that make us the same as a gun-toting terrorist? No, we're holding the guns in order to defend our children, in order to defend ourselves, in order to defend our homes. We're not doing it because we want to kill somebody. We're doing it because we want to prevent somebody from hurting our families. That's why. But if you're saying a gun is evil, then you don't understand that. Then you can't understand them. Then you're blinding yourself to the distinction between a murderer and a mother trying to defend herself and her family from the murderer. You can't see the difference. You are evil if you can't make that distinction. And that's precisely why Guterres's remarks were so appalling, because he won't make the distinction. And if a mother kills a terrorist, well, she just killed somebody. So she's evil. She's as evil as the person who came in to kill her because she just killed somebody. Or is she a hero? You can only understand that that mother is a hero if you understand that there's a distinction between good and evil. Not innocent and guilty, but good and evil. Mommy is good. The person coming to kill the babies is bad. Guterres doesn't want to see that. The person coming to destroy a society by annihilating its people is evil. Now, if you look at a society that is dedicated to evil, then you have to question what it means to preserve that society intact, which is precisely what Guterres wants to do with the Palestinians of Gaza. He doesn't want to look at the sickness, the moral depravity of that society, of which Hamas is an organic whole, is an organic part, because he doesn't want it. He, he doesn't want to reconcile with the fact that it's evil. He doesn't want to reckon with the fact that it's evil. He does want to reconcile with the fact that it's evil. And he wants to say that he supports that evil. 
And he's not alone. He's not alone. We're all setting upon Guterres because what he said was so open, so in your face, grotesque. Ellie Cohen is sitting there at the Security Council, our foreign minister, with families of Israelis who are being held hostage by Hamas. And this is what the Secretary General of the United Nations has to say. He, you know, and of course, he's not alone, right? Because he is reflecting the positions of every single UN agency. The World Health Organization said nothing about the massacre, only attacking Israel. Same with UNRWA, whose members are almost all members of Hamas in Gaza. Almost all of them are members of Hamas. And he cried about 35 of them being killed in Israeli airstrikes. First of all, I don't know where the number is from. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. I have no reason to believe anything he said. But aside from that, even if 35 of them were killed, how many of the 35 support Hamas, are members of Hamas, are, are terrorists in Hamas? Many, many, because the vast majority of his employees in Gaza for UNRWA are members of Hamas. They have to be, even if they don't really support its doctrine of genocide, because they live under Hamas rule. So, you know, the, the, the concept that there's a distinction is something he doesn't want to make because he wants to enable evil. That's what his moral depravity is, at, is about at base. But again, he's not alone. Two days ago, Barack Obama. Yeah, remember Barack Obama, the guy who's still, you know, who who told uh, 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 who told uh, what's his name? I can't remember the guy from Comedy Central that his dream is to hide in his basement and and uh, have a line into the president's ear and tell him what to do. He wants to he wants to be a ventriloquist and that his Charlie McCarthy doll would be the president of the United States. Remember Stephen Colbert. He told that to him, oh, 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 how funny. So, no, he's not in power anymore. He's not. But he puts out this whole long statement two days ago about the war uh, that Hamas launched against Israel. Spent a good few paragraphs talking about how bad it is and how anti-Semitism is bad. And yeah, it's true that some Israeli government, some, but, you know, not all, for instance, he hates Netanyahu, but whatever. Some Israeli governments have made good faith efforts to 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 uh, have peace with the Palestinians, and they were rebuffed. But again, like Antonio Guterres, Barack Obama devoted the majority of his of his very long statement, actually, I think it's like three pages long, to the suffering of the Palestinian people under the jackboot of of occupation. And I'll just read you one paragraph, which, by the way, appears on his website as like the most highlighted, meaning that the people who are going to him for his pearls of wisdom. Are, are citing this one the most. So I, I might as well just read it because he talks about the suffering of the Palestinians. I, I mean, and he devotes paragraphs to this, okay? Paragraphs. And I guess I should say parenthetically that the whole concept of Gaza being an open-air prison is a total lie. It's a complete lie, all right? It, and it's never been true. And it certainly is not something that anybody can point a finger at Israel regarding the fact that it is untrue, but whatever, since 2005, because Gaza has been completely independent since 2005, when we left Gaza and took our people, expelled our people with us. We removed our military forces, we removed our people, and yet, you know, and the, the so-called international community, including progressives like Obama, right, insisted that we're still in charge. Why? Because, because Jews, we have to be in charge of people, because if we're not, you know, then they're going to have to be culpable for their own misdeeds. And we can't have that because then how do we blame the Jews in our in our amoral immorality that we call morality? So anyway, this is what Mr. Obama, uh, who isn't the president of the United States, of course, said, you know, about being fair-minded. So he said, it means acknowledging that Palestinians have also lived in disputed territories for generations, that many of them were not only displaced when Israel was formed, but continue to be forcibly displaced by a settler movement that too often has received tacit or explicit support from the Israeli government, that Palestinian leaders who've been willing to make concessions for a two-state solution, who, none of them, but whatever, two-state solution, have too often had little to show for their efforts. Yeah, Gaza, lock, stock, and barrel, that's nothing to show, right? 99% of Palestinians in Judea and Samaria who have been living under Palestinian rule since 1996, that's nothing, right? That's nothing. That's nothing. They have too little to show for it. They've been independent. They've had fully autonomous self-government 
since 1996, occupation, occupation, too little to show for their efforts, and that it is possible for people of goodwill to champion Palestinian rights and oppose certain Israeli government policies in the West Bank and Gaza without being anti-Semitic. Well, no. Okay. You know why? Let me explain to you why. All right. Because the Palestinians are not interested in a state. And they've made this clear over and over and over again. The fact that Barack Obama and all of his ilk have refused to listen to them is their problem. The Palestinians have said they want a state on the, on, on the ruins of the Jewish state. They do not want a two-state solution. They want Israel destroyed. All of them say it. Every single one, Mahmoud Abbas, Yasser Arafat, all of their lieutenants that everybody upholds as moderates, all of them say it. I'm sick and tired of having to tell you this over and over again, because you're not going to listen, Barack Obama, and all of your, you know, wonderful, morally, morally blind and obtuse followers and supporters. You don't want to hear it. You don't care. But that is the truth. And anybody who does care now, anybody who cares about the truth will also care maybe about the distinction between morality and immorality, between good and evil. But you don't because the fact that you refuse to listen to anything, to hear what they're saying and to watch what they're doing means that you don't want to know. You don't care because you are not interested in morality. You are not interested in sanctifying life. You are not interested in good versus evil. You're interested in something else. Why is it that the Germans refused to have a moral reckoning after World War II? What is it that enabled them to avoid it? How come people didn't force them to? How come people were willing to suffice with them saying, we won't have an army and we're going to declare ourselves pacifists because the reason that there was a Holocaust is because of militarism instead of evil? That, that lurked, that lived in the heart of the German people that enabled them, that caused them, that provoked them to become Nazis. Why? Because their target were the Jews. That's why. Because people didn't want to give up Jew hatred after the Holocaust. They still wanted it. They still wanted it, but they saw that it was, you know, it was no longer in style. So they pretended they were reckoning with it when they said, Okay, yeah, you know, militarism said that's bad. That's bad. Yeah, Germany, you, you've been denazified because you become openly pacifist, right? Except the pacifism was a wonderful way to repackage, to, to repackage Jew hatred, right? Because what were the Jews becoming at the same time? Independent. We were becoming independent and trying to, trying to defeat more forces of genocide, the invading Arab armies and the Arabs who lived in the land of Israel and tried to annihilate the Jews of the land of Israel. So suddenly the Jews are the ones who are militaristic. Well, if I'm pacifist and that means that I'm moral, then the Jews are immoral. Now, it's not all the Jews, just the Zionist Jews. And then the Soviets came along and helpfully invented the concept of anti-Zionism, right? That was a new Jew. So you transplanted your hatred of individual Jews on a racial basis of anti-Semitism and your communal hatred of Judaism, the Judeophobia that you, you got with Christianity, and you reinvented it, you repackaged it as anti-Zionism. Ah, we're happy with the Jews who are, as a Jew, Jews who are always going to be embarrassed and ashamed of the militaristic Jews in the land of Israel, right? It's just those, you know, who carry guns. It's just those who defend themselves against your apparent allies and friends, you know, the Palestinians, just those that are bad. What did, what did Barack Hussein Obama call them? The settler movement. The settler movement. He even says that the Palestinians are living in disputed territory. Been disputed by me. Disputed by me because they belong to us and under international law too, not that anybody ever cares, but it's true. The international law, such as it is, the law of nations, such as it is, sides with Israel's claim to these disputed territories, not to these murderers who sanctify death. But be that as it may, put all of that truthy stuff behind us, you know. Why is it? Why is it that this concept, right, that there's something inherently wrong with Jewish national liberation and Jewish political freedom and self-determination in our land, is evil because you never dealt with evil after the Holocaust because you you put it on a tool of war 
put it on a tool of genocide. Gas chambers, they're evil. Well, yeah, they're evil, I guess. I mean, yeah, right? They're killing machines and you invented them to more effectively kill Jews on a mass scale. It's true, but they were an expression of German evil. That's what they were an expression of. They were an arm of a killing machine that was that that was being used by a nation involved, engaged, committed to the annihilation of the Jewish people because that people had embraced evil as an organizing principle of their society. Okay? That's why. I mean, I guess under all circumstances, you could say the gas chambers are evil. All right, fair enough. I'll give you that. But rifles? Rifles? Well, they're evil, right? They're uh, instruments of evil when they're being used by Einsatzgruppen against the Jews of, of, of Kiev or when they're being used by Islamo Nazi Nazis from, from Hamas when they're slaughtering Jewish families in, in, in the kibbutzim of southern Israel or, or at a dance party along the Gaza border. Yeah, but not when they're used by our forces who are trying to defeat this death machine, this death society that, that, that engenders, that is engendered by, that is informed by a genocidal hatred of Jews. You know, and of course, it's not just him, right? Let's just, let's just be clear. It, it, Barack Obama is the leader of, of a movement, of a movement, of, 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 of the progressive camp in the United States and large elements of the liberal community in the United States, which has lost its right to refer to itself as liberal. Lost its right. John Stuart Mill is vomiting at the sight of these people. All right? Vomiting. He can't stop. But he's their leader. And the expressions that he's giving of moral relativism and embrace of depravity through his statement two days ago are expressed everywhere in the Biden administration and in the elite institutions of the United States of America. The Biden, the Biden spokeswoman, Corrine Jean-Pierre, was asked about the rise in anti-Semitism and what the Biden administration thought about it the other day at her briefing. And, 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 and I think it's worth noting what it is that this woman said. What it is that this woman said. She was asked about anti-Semitism. And let's just be clear. You know, I, I, I think it was the Anti-Defamation -Def League. They put out, the, and you know, they're not an authority for me because they have long turned a blind eye to progressive anti-Semitism. But be that as it may, they said that since the beginning of the year, there were 108 anti-Semitic attacks on Jews. And there were six anti-Muslim attacks. Maybe these were the FBI's uh, actually data. I have to look it up. The ADL said that since October 7th, there have been 150 anti-Semitic attacks. And we see them everywhere in America. We see all of these pro-Hamas demonstrations outside the White House, on, in Times Square, in Boston, in Chicago, everywhere. Seattle. All the major cities of America, you see them. And of course, across campuses, you know, the more elite you are, the bigger your, your, your pro-Hamas brigades are, right? We've seen it all over. The Biden administration, rather, it should, so Corrine Jean-Pierre, she answers the, the question about anti-Semitism in America by talking about anti-Muslim violence. We have not seen uh, any credible uh, threats. I know there's been always questions about uh, credible threats to be Muslim have endured a disproportionate uh, number of hate-fueled attacks. Uh, and certainly President Biden understands that many of our Muslim Arab Arab Americans and Palestinian American loved ones and neighbors are worried about the hate being directed at their communities. What anti-Muslim violence? Because, you know, this is the same White House that has been having listening sessions with the staffers, the poor staffers, who feel so uncomfortable with U.S. support for Israel. Well, poor little White House spent staffers, like, like Mahir Bitar. The, the guy who says that Israel's an apartheid state who, who waged his university, Georgetown University's anti-Semitic BDS campaign when he was a student leader? Or, or what's her name? Rima something, who's the, the, the liaison between the White House and co Congress? 
who praised suicide bombers in 2002 when she was a student at, at Berkeley. And they, yeah, she must be feeling bad right now because because President Biden said all those mean things about Hamas, who she supports. So they're having, you know, Jake Sullivan, he's having these listening sessions with White House staffers who feel bad about the Biden administration's support for Israel. Same thing Blinken is doing with his State Department, wounded the wounded ones in the State Department, you know, as if this was some sort of college campus. And really what is happening on the college campuses, you know, I'm sick and tired of seeing these students, these Jewish students begging to their college administrators. It's happening on colleges across America. I saw yesterday some footage from Berkeley doing these Jewish girls begging their, what is it called? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Only if you're not Jewish, right? DEI for everybody but the Jews. They're, they're, they're little Zarina at, uh, at Berkeley standing there, right? And refusing to defend the Jewish uh, students from this rising wave tsunami of pro-Hamas sentiment on the campus because she's with them. She supports genocide. You know, sorry, 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 right? The, the moral, the moral, obtuseness, the, more, the, the, the refusal, the evasion of a moral reckoning after the Holocaust has bred this full-throated embrace of evil because the whole evasion was, enabled, was, was to enable the, the repackaging of anti-Semitism. And it was taken from the Nazis, exported here to the Middle East, and used by the same people who enabled, who collaborated with the Nazis, right, throughout World War II, who didn't let the Jews escape them, who didn't let us come to their countries, right, and escape, and of course the British who blocked Jewish immigration to the land of Israel, it, in contravention of their international legal duties under the, under the League of Nations mandate at the time. Right. They broke the law in order to block the escape of Jews and the emigration of the Jews of Europe to the land of Israel. And they were required to enable it under inter 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 international law. But they blocked it. So they also were collaborating. Everybody collaborated at the end with the evasion of moral reckoning by the Germans. Because they wanted to repackage Jew hatred and they did it successfully. And today we're seeing it. Today we're seeing it everywhere. And then you go and then you go. Finally, right, to so just get to the end of this. Yesterday, Prime Minister Netanyahu met with French President Emmanuel Macron. And Macron is hopefully the last of this parade of international leaders who come to Israel to, on the one hand, express solidarity with us in our hour of need, and on the other hand, are telling us not to fight to defeat Hamas. I mean, I think... Macron's statement, which was then echoed uh, this morning, Wednesday morning, in a CNN report citing Pentagon forces. They went, no, 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 don't invade Gaza. Don't invade Gaza. What you should do is you can continue a little bit of your, your aerial bombing, but you know you should really just go in and, and like specific secrete commando, commando raids into Gaza you know, to try to protect your, your hostages. But don't go in and defeat your enemy. That, that's wrong. Oh, and, and Barack Obama, I forgot to mention, in this egregious statement that he made, he's talked about how if Israel doesn't follow international law and defend all of these innocent civilians and we're going to lose international support as if we have it now. But pretend a second for the second for the point of this argument we have it now. He's saying if you defend yourself, you're going to lose it. So you get to be precious little Jews who everybody feels bad for. But if you want to go be fierce Jews who defend themselves... Well, that is, if you want to be free, we're going to we're going to condemn you. We're not going to stand with you anymore. Well, thanks a lot. Support. OK, you never supported us. You hate Israel. You spent eight years of the presidency popularizing the idea that 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 we're the bad guys in this fight. And it came out very strongly in your appalling statement two days ago. So thank you very much. No, thank you. OK, Mr. Obama. But I'm telling you, right, they, so, so Netanyahu meets with Macron and they stand in front. And I really hope that we don't have to see any more of these duplicitous, these two faced international leaders coming in and telling us, you know, how to fight our wars. That is not, not fight our wars. I meant to say, meant, I meant to say not fight our wars. So Netanyahu said here something, something important. You see, he said, 
today is time for the re he said here i'm sorry he said here today the test for the west and for civilization is hamas if hamas emerges victorious we will all lose europe will be in danger everyone will be in danger civilization will be in danger if hamas loses and is defeated then the forces of civilization win but here's the thing right what the underlying message that netanyahu was trying to communicate i think certainly the message that i'm explicitly communicating here is that 78 years after the holocaust right was it 78 years after the establishment of the united nations which has become you know i mean it's not that the lunatics have taken over the asylum it's that the the murderers have taken over the prison right that that's what's happened here anyway 78 years after the un what this moment calls for for the nations of the world is to finally have the moral reckoning that you've evaded for 78 years that you've refused to have or countenance or even acknowledge for 78 years now is the time to throw all of the gobbledygook moral relativism, postmodernism that you've developed and invented in order to evade that moral reckoning, throw it into the garbage can, along with, you know, the vomit that John Stuart Mill is vomiting on you. Throw it all away, flush it down the toilet, because it's all vomit, all right? Throw it all away and leave yourself to reckon with the fact that the Jews are good, that Israel is a force of good in the world, and that the people who are trying to annihilate us are evil monsters. They're not innocent civilians. And if any innocent civilians are able to survive, it has to be first and foremost the Jews. And as to Gaza, let me hear their voices. Not one person has come forward, not in Judea and Samaria under the moderate Palestinian authority, and not in Gaza separating themselves away from what Hamas did, saying, this cannot stand, this is depraved, this is not who we are. Anyone who comes forward, I will support. Not one! Not one voice! Now you have to reckon with that. Now you have to reckon with the fact that the Jews are the good guys and that you have to stand with us because you're on the line. We know the truth. Netanyahu said in that statement, we will win, we have to win, there's no choice. And I tell you what, if he buckles, if the army buckles, we will throw them out of power faster than they can say, we must win. Because if they don't, the entire nation of Israel will not forgive them. And they know that too. And they know that too. They know that too. But you, America, you, Britain, you, France, you, United Nations, all of you have to understand that Israel will survive this. We will win because we know, we know we don't have a choice. You don't have a choice either. Though. All those thousands of people in the streets of London and Paris and wherever the hell else they are and across America and, and Sydney, Australia, that are braying on behalf of genocide and Hamas, they're not in a position to fight us. They're in a position to fight you. And they are empowered by what Hamas did. They're empowered still more by your moral blindness, obtuseness, and evil. And if you don't step up to the plate, they're coming after you. They're coming after you. We're going to win. We will accept nothing but victory here whatever the price. You, that's up for you to decide. And the only way that you're going to move forward and actually win and protect yourselves is if you stand with us today. Those are my thoughts. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you again later very soon. Take care.